Let us begin with prayer before we dive into Isaiah 60, but we will be in Isaiah 60 today. And we'll finish it up today, of course. Let's pray. <laughs> Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this day and for this class and for your word here in Isaiah 60. We ask that you would open our eyes to what it is that you're trying to say. Open our ears and our hearts and our hands to go and do what it is that you are calling us to do as a result of what your word has said. So, Holy Spirit, we ask you here to guide us into all that is true. Lord, keep us from believing lies and bless this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The question mark. I typically title them, and I had a title, but I deleted the title. And I left a question mark in its place, because what is Isaiah 60 about? You tell me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that sort of thing. The, the glory of it, sure. All, oh, the, okay, he said Millennial Kingdom. All right, maybe. But <clears throat> I watched two sermons on Isaiah 60 this week, and I had a lot of fun doing it, and I tried to watch more. There's not a lot out there on YouTube, anyway. Um, and Isaiah, you know, let's face it, it's a difficult uh, book to teach through. <laughs> How long has it been? Since 2014. <laughs> well, we're in 60. It's the last, uh, uh, well, 66 or how many books or chapters we've got in, and books in the Bible and chapters in this uh, book. So we're almost there. But there were two approaches that I found to explaining, you know, the, ooh, I like that, <laughs> to explaining what Isaiah 60 is about. And these are those two approaches. The first approach was this. A, a question? Oh, thank you. Sorry. Hermeneutics. Okay. <laughs> Hermeneutics is a terminology used in many circumstances, but mostly in theological circles. It is, I, I pulled a Dylan. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> and I knew it when I wrote it. It is the, like the art and science of understanding and interpreting Scripture. That is hermeneutics. So hermeneutics is simply when you're coming to God's Word, how can you understand it? What methodology are you going to take in order to understand God's Word? And so I've got two different approaches that I observed. The first was... The Holy Spirit will reveal to you what it really means. So just pray and see. That was the first approach. It wasn't, you know, look at anything background or look at anything pertaining to grammar or uh, theology of the, of the Bible and, and how it relates to other books in the Bible and other, or how it relates even to chapter 59. It was just, this is my methodology, and it is acceptable. And it was cool because the sermon had plenty of comments in it with people saying this. You know, ah, finally, uh, the, the Holy Spirit revealed some other chapter to me as well. And I've, I've known these, these types where they say, well, you know, there's the meaning, and then there's the meaning that the Holy Spirit gives you, which is interesting. Uh, what's wrong with this? Okay, it, yeah, the Spirit could tell you one thing, and the Spirit could tell me another thing. There's no way to fact check it. No fact check. That's right, because it's authoritative. It's the Holy Spirit. Yeah. You're going to go against the Holy Spirit? No. Well, it, it doesn't really involve what we, the revelation that we have regarding, um, like you just said a little while ago, uh, maybe in the other class, of huh. uh, we should appreciate the members of, members of the body of, of the Lord, of the believers who are gifted, like where they get the teaching. Sure. He is going to do and give them insight that he's not going to give somebody who doesn't have to get the teaching. Okay. Because they're all, the teachers are, are to equip the, the saints for the work of the ministry. Yes. So you just can't everybody be independent and, and expect to have the same insight that a guy with the gift of teaching is going to have. 
Okay. You need to be there in church or Sunday school class, as Sunday school class, mm -hmm. to benefit from a person who is gifted, so that they can build you up and, and you know pull all this information together and all research and study. That's all excellent points. Yeah. So, yeah, that's just contrary to that in a, in a big, in a major way. I mean, sure, we have to pray. Is it, it, yeah. Is it a, a part of what we do? Yes, yeah, part. Yes, but not. Okay. It's not, just, it's not the totality. <clears throat> okay. Yes, Matt. Sometimes when, when you pray and ask, you don't get an answer, and it's not clear. I like that a lot. Very good. Peter was like that. Some things are hard to understand that Paul wrote. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> wow. um, sometimes it's difficult to distinguish between your own thoughts and opinions, and you know, is Ooh. It, is God telling you this, or is it yeah. God this? this is massive difficulty, and and the interesting thing is. This kind of thought started to enter the church in the late 200s, and then it, it kind of had different schools of thought around it. And everything in Scripture started to become an allegory, and it meant something else. And then you had all these teachers who were saying that uh, they were looking at, say, the, the uh, parable of the widow's might, and, and saying that, it, it was really talking about Peter and Paul and, and trying to divine all these interesting applications and creating new kind of doctrine and all that kind of stuff. And there's infinite number of, of interpretations, interpretations, uh, your science and art of interpreting scripture. Uh, and, and so therefore now everything was meaningless, except for whatever the particular teacher at that time said, this is what it means. Yes, sir. Remember what Pastor said this morning in the sermon? Like uh, all my problems are because I haven't really believed all the promises of God. Hmm. Remember that in the sermon? Okay. Well, I mean, the point is that I'm trying to make is that a lot of the you know, problems we have, as far as like in hermeneutics, is like because we haven't really read the whole Bible. Yes. And and done you know some systematic theology where we're bringing in all these cross references. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and that that is all very important. So what about this other approach? Take a word in the passage and find out where else it was used in the Bible and then teach all the passages that you drew it from and then push that meaning into the passage that you originally took it from. You know what I'm saying? Like the word light, for example. If it says um, God is light or something or, you know, let your light shine, then you might look up the word light and maybe shine and find all times that it was used in the Bible in all the different contexts that it was used in and then apply it to the particular chapter that you're looking in. What's wrong with this? The context of the passage you're looking at could be different than the context that yes. it was used later, so... That's absolutely it. Well, I mean, do you, do you do the Hebrew word or the English word or both? Or? Well, hopefully, the when you look at the English word, then it forces you to look at the Greek or Hebrew word as well. Well, that's another thing. Do you use the, the Greek or the Hebrew in the Old Testament because it was translated into both? Yeah, or you could look at what did it say in the Septuagint, the Greek Old Testament. Yeah, and versus what it said in the Hebrew. Yeah, yeah. But you're stuck with, let us jump from this context into a completely different context and try to make them all say the same thing. So, in doing so, you may be teaching something very useful, but it may have nothing to do with the actual chapter that you're in. And so, therefore, when somebody is listening to what that teacher is teaching and saying, what is chapter 60 about? Oh, it's about this. I say that you all have the ability to practice good hermeneutics, sorry to use the word again, the big word, uh, to interpret scripture uh, by using a proper methodology, but you have to have the Holy Spirit, and you do have to look at words as well. Um, <clears throat> so let's, let's look a little more in depth as to what 
these two different uh, methodologies produced. So the first one, Isaiah 60, is about a blessed church that is in the light and all the blessings that they get if they live in the light. And here's what you get. If your church is living in the light, then you attract people from the whole earth to come into your worship service. You get money from all nations. The wealth of the nations will pour into your particular church. So if we're talking about Cyprus Bible Church, and Cyprus Bible Church is living in the light, then all nations will come here, and all their money is going to come here. Oh, you should have heard how excited the audience was. Uh, the big one was, and you get gold. They were going nuts over that. The sad thing is, he talked, he, he was, they were cheering and shouting, and he was talking about something about the righteousness of Christ. And he said it like that, expecting cheers and stuff, and it was silent. And he went back to, the, you get gold. And they were cheering and, and all happy again about it. And the smallest one among you will be like a multitude of blessings and you yourself will be able to draw the wealth of the nations to yourself and to your congregation. So, But the, the purpose was really when you're living like Christ you're going to get rich and your church is going to get wealthy and all nations will just flock to you and you know the, even the poorest among you will be driving a Porsche or Jaguar or or an XQ17938 Z589 er Porsche sedans. Dan Dan's and his Porsche sedans. <laughs> most of my life until I built one and now I have one. Oh. Well, now I got kids in college, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you would live in the light. That's right. <laughs> or if your whole church would, perhaps. So that was uh, that was his take. That was that pastor's take on it. Uh, but Isaiah 60, on the other methodology, was about walking in a light lifestyle. Isaiah 60 is trying to teach you to walk in the light. It's a reminder for us to walk in righteousness by arising and shining. And you arise and you shine. Uh, you don't live a passive life. You please God in your life. Okay? And you don't make any compromises with the world. Do you have a problem with any of this? It's just, you gotta, you gotta read the first half of the first verse to see this. stupid. Well, is this good stuff? I think the biggest church in town teaches this. <laughs> but is this by itself, is this, not this, I think this is trash and false teaching, but uh, this here. Is this bad stuff that's being taught? For the uh, chapter we're in, yes, it is. Okay, for the chapter, well, well, that's why we have question mark for what the chapter is. So maybe, maybe they're right. Uh, rise up and be a mission-oriented people. So that's what Isaiah 60 is talking about. The majority of his time was spent in like the first five words of the chapter, and then uh, he went all over the place and found all sorts of other verses with arising and shining and light and the Old and New Testament and then he got into a couple of traps where he was in his cross reference he said well I gotta kind of explain it a little better because uh, here's the situation and your little sidetracks and, and that can happen sometimes when you're when you're really stretching and looking for some cross references awesome. yes ma'am uh, so the sermon that you watched you might not share with us who it was but is it someone that you agree with a lot or is it someone that in this particular chapter? This particular chapter was the first time. That you disagreed with him? No, the first time that I heard him oh, first, preach. Okay. First time that I heard either one of them preach. You don't really know his theological background? Uh, are they from here? Or in Houston? No. Okay. No. I'll have a picture of both of them later. <laughs> so, uh, not to be rude to them, and I'm not going to say who they are, but if you go and you look for Isaiah 60 sermons, <laughs> or type in Isaiah 60, you will find both of them. I would say it's likely that I probably agree with this guy a lot, uh, but his methodology was just messed up. It, it's, it's looking at something the wrong way and drawing the wrong conclusions, and then looking at something uh, the right way but drawing the wrong conclusions for the, the passage that you're in. 
Uh, so these are traps that you can fall into. And the big trap here is what is the difference between Holy Spirit and me? Because we can have all sorts of ideas in our minds. And we can convince ourselves that it's the Holy Spirit talking to you. I recall a young lad who said that he didn't have to live under the law. Because Paul said we don't live under the law. And through the Holy Spirit in, inside the young man, <laughs> he didn't believe that he had to live under the laws of Texas. Which, you know, can create all sorts of trouble. How old is this, this lad was in eighth grade. <laughs> he got better. <laughs> but, but hermeneutics is key. It's key to understanding in context, and that's what's so important. And what made me uh, sad was to see that the context of this was uh, transgressed. Oh yeah, okay, one last point he had. We are called to shine and be the light of the world. We are, the, oh, this is the bad part. We are the light of the world, and they will glorify God because of our light. He was emphasizing this, that we are the light of the world which is fine if you think of it in terms of right now the world is in darkness, the Lord has left us here to go into the nations and bring the light, the true light is Jesus. But is that what this passage is talking about? We are the light. That's going to be a little difficult. So, how can you understand a chapter of the Bible? How does this kind of meld into what Luther used to call perpiscuity? You know, he used to believe that, you know, if you read the Bible, you're going to understand the Bible, because that was the whole argument in the Reformation. You know, the Catholic Church says, you know, you need us to tell you what the Bible says. And Luther was like, no, just read the Bible. And yeah. You'll know what it says. Yeah. And, and he also thought in terms of, even if there are a multitude of interpretations, it is better than the prevailing wrong interpretation that the Catholic, Roman Catholic Church was putting forth. Yeah, that's so there is that danger... I mean, it's a danger for anything. I mean, who's going to open up the Count of Monte Cristo and just open it up and point and start reading and then start telling you what it's all about if, if you know all about the Count of Monte Cristo? You know, if you open any book like that, you're going to get it wrong, especially if, if you know nothing about it. The Count of Monte Cristo is a science fiction novel that takes place on the planet Gorog. Yeah, yeah you'd be laughed at. But, you know, if, if, if somebody opens the Bible and says something that's equally as foolish, well, tell me more. Well, they do that with Ezekiel all the time. <laughs> yeah, they do. <laughs> How can you understand a chapter? All right, that's okay. Uh, <laughs> While we go through chapter 60, I want you to honestly consider the validity of their points, okay, and the conclusions that they have drawn. And I also want you to consider the conclusions that I have drawn, uh, but I have drawn mine by using my uh, hermeneutical style, which is the historical, literal, grammatical, geographical, cultural, uh, all this approach of looking at it in context. I want you to see the difference not to lift myself up whatsoever. The important thing is that you learn to read the Bible and, and understand it in its context. Because if you, if you can do that on your own, man, your life's going to be better. You'll be a better friend a better child, a better parent, a better everything, if you can do it. But consider them. <coughs> consider them, because their argument would be that I'm off my rocker. Uh, but let's look at the background. Um, Isaiah 59. So last week, <coughs> Dylan took us through Isaiah 59. And Isaiah 59 is great. There's a lot of contrast between Isaiah 59 and Isaiah 60. Isaiah 59 was talking about how God's people were separated from God. They're filled with all sorts of sin and un unrighteousness. Murder even was mentioned. And all sorts of injustice. And so therefore salvation is far from them and they are without hope. 
very dismal there in the majority of chapter 59. Yeah, I put the illustration here of uh, the, the bridge illustration with the, the cross in the middle, mankind on this side, uh, Jesus bridged the gap. Um, because it also said, you can't do it, therefore God's own arm is going to bring you salvation. Okay, and that is accomplished through the cross. God promised here in, in chapter 59, Isaiah, that God's arm would bring salvation, and he did, of course. And then it said, God's wrath is going to go against all of his adversaries, the Jews and the Gentiles. Okay, so his, he brings salvation. Well, they're, they're backsliding, they're falling away, they're not believing the truth. He brings salvation, and then he's going to bring his wrath. And after that, Jews and Gentiles will return to God. And a Redeemer will come to Zion. A Redeemer will come to Jerusalem. And that's kind of where we're, we're left off. Uh, believers will then have God's Word in their mouths. Oh yeah, this, this was uh, the New Covenant. In this, in this reality, when the Redeemer comes to Zion after the judgment, then believers are going to have His Word in their mouths and they're not going to depart from it. They're not going to sin anymore. Okay? So this is where 59 left us off. So then you might expect 60 to be building on what 59 said, right? And probably not talking about how your church can make a lot of money or how that you should correct the way that you act when it says that you're going to be corrected. Um, so here's a sequence of events. Judah falls into evil and false teaching, wickedness, all that kind of stuff. Uh, the Messiah comes and works salvation for all who believes. God comes and saves them. God exercises judgment. After judgment, the Messiah comes to Zion, uh, which this very much is kind of like end time stuff we're talking about. Uh, he brings salvation. Then there's judgment. After judgment, he comes to Zion. The Redeemer comes to Zion. Okay? And then after, after the judgment, after this, the believers are perfected. This is what 59 is talking about. So, uh, 60, you are right in saying it has, uh, has a lot to do with the millennial reign of the Messiah, the millennial reign of Christ. So, to, in order to understand this a little better, you have to look to see what was their expectation of the millennium in, uh, in the Old Testament? What were the Jews expecting? What did the Bible have to say about it? I've probably taken you many times, if you recall, to Genesis 49, uh, verse 10, uh, which, which talks about when, when Jacob is giving a blessing to Judah his fourth born son, and says that he will be the leader, but he makes a promise that says, from you though, will come the one to whom the real leadership belongs, and to him will be the obedience of all nations. So this is saying the Messiah will come from Judah's line, and he will rule all nations, not just the twelve tribes, not just the Jews, and or not just the Israelites, but the Gentiles as well. And the Messiah will, and in Psalm 2 and Isaiah 11, it talks about how the Messiah will reign all nations from Zion. So all of this that we've been looking at in Isaiah 59 is meeting the requirements of what has already been spoken of previously in God's Word. All nations will follow the Messiah. All God's people will return to Jerusalem in the millennial reign. This is their expectation. Okay, from, just from Genesis 49, Psalm 2, Isaiah 11. Isaiah 2, 1 through 4 said in the future, all nations will come to the Lord's mountain at Jerusalem. So there's an expectation that not just will they return, the righteous remnant return, but all the earth will come to Jerusalem. And Jerusalem will be the center of the world, and Jerusalem then will be glorious. And that's Isaiah 2, 1 through 4, and that's the start of Isaiah. Well, that is similar to what we're reading, we're going to read about in Isaiah 60, so therefore you have to use that to help interpret. What a coincidence. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, Jeremiah 23, 5 through 8, 31, 31 through 40. All nations will follow the branch of Jesse, which was also spoken of in Isaiah 11 as well. Ezekiel 37 says David will rule over Jerusalem forever because God made promises to the line of David that one would come from him who would reign forever. Here it's using the, the actual name of David. Uh, here previously it said the branch of Jesse, which was a reference to the Messiah. David is also a reference to the Messiah. Daniel 7, 13 through 14 says that the Son of Man will rule all people. You know what else he says? They will worship him. No way are we supposed to call to worship a man, but uh, God only. Uh, Micah, the Messiah, will rule over all the world, not just uh, Jerusalem. Zechariah 14, God himself will rule all nations in Jerusalem. Who is this Redeemer? God himself. The Messiah's feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. Okay? Uh, and you've got to understand, in Jerusalem there's three hills. Uh, one is the Mount of Olives, and the other one is uh, Mount Moriah, and the other one is sometimes referred to as Mount Zion. But the whole thing can be thought of as Zion. But he will stand on the Mount of Olives. And the king in Jerusalem shall be worshipped by all nations. Far be it that we would actually worship David, but that we would worship the Messiah who came from the line of David. Okay, so now that you have some of this background, which is in keeping with where 59 was taking us, let us see and consider where 60 is taking us. Perhaps it is taking us into this millennial picture, or perhaps it is taking us into what a church can receive financially, or perhaps it is taking us into you need to start walking in the light and do what is right and live a missional life so that people will see your light and be drawn to it. So let us consider. And we'll begin verses 1 through 3. And, and let me also say, uh, the interpretation that I am providing here is not original. Okay, It's not like I just came up with it brand new. Many other scholars completely agree with this. Okay, So it's not like I'm saying something new. All right, verses 1 through 3. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness will cover the earth, and deep darkness the peoples. But the Lord will rise upon you, and His glory will appear upon you. Nations will come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. Okay, so we, we do see the light has come from God. The glory of God has shined upon them. The source, therefore, of the light is God. And it is shining upon uh, Israel. Okay, but we'll have to understand what is exactly going on. We were just left with the whole idea of the Redeemer coming to Zion. We're going to see that it refers more to Zion, which you can think in terms of as Israel, or think more in terms of as, as Jerusalem. Um, and, but it said, he said here, there's darkness is over the earth. Okay? But when the light comes, the nations will see the light and be drawn to it. And this darkness that these nations are in is mental, spiritual, intellectual, and maybe even physical. And this event does take place, if we're thinking consecutively with chapter 59, after God's judgment. And you can imagine what the earth may look like after God's judgment. What kind of uh, situation may exist in, on, on this planet and in the cities especially. But the light will enter Jerusalem and all nations will be drawn to the light. Okay, A Redeemer comes to Zion. When the Redeemer is there, the light is there. Jesus is the light of the world. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness doesn't understand it. But here we see the darkness is getting a clue because uh, nations are coming to it. This is what it said in, in John, John, uh, Gospel of John, verses 1 through 13, that the darkness didn't understand it. But here we see that it is more like Revelation 20, 1 through 6, where the Messiah is ruling in Jerusalem over the whole earth. And here we see it in this and, and these first uh, three verses. 
we see that nations are drawn to the light now. Now they're getting it, right? And the, it is the light that makes us rise up and shine, okay? It is the light of Jesus that makes us rise up and shine. It's kind of a point that one of those pastors made. It is kind of like the sun versus the moon. We reflect the light as the moon reflects the light of the sun. But the source of the light is the sun itself, just as the source of the light is God himself. Let's keep pressing on, 4 through 9. Lift up your eyes round about and see. They all gather together. They come to you. Your sons will come from afar, and your daughters will be carried in their arms. Then you will see and be radiant, and your heart will thrill and rejoice, because the abundance of the sea will be turned to you. The wealth of the nations will come to you. A multitude of camels will cover you. The young camels of Midian and Ephah, all those from Sheba will come. They will bring gold and frankincense, and will bear good news of the praises of the Lord. All the flocks of Kedar will be gathered together to you. The rams of Nebaioth will minister to you. They will go up with acceptance on my altar, and I shall glorify my glorious house. Who are these who fly like a cloud and like the doves to their lattices? Surely the coastlands will wait for me, and the ships of Tarshish will come first to bring your sons from afar, the silver and their gold with them, for the name of the Lord your God, and for the Holy One of Israel, because He has glorified you. They bring their silver and their gold with them for the name of the Lord your God, and for the Holy One of Israel, because He has glorified you. So we see here that the, the light is globally embraced. In the Gospel of John chapter 1, the light came to the darkness and the darkness did not understand it. Here, the light has come to the darkness and the darkness gets it. Because all the lies that they base their entire society upon has come smashing down around them at the judgment of God. All of the things they told themselves and believed to be true were nothing more than darkness enshrouding them. And yet here the light has come and it is globally embraced. This is an amazing picture because he's talking about Gentile nations. And Israel itself will be restored. And this isn't just Israel. This is the righteous remnant and they will come from all over the earth. All of those that are believers come from all over the earth into this Jerusalem in the millennial reign of Christ. Okay, they come from all over the earth. And, and Jerusalem is restored. And the, the Jew and the Gentile righteous remnant because uh, not all those who are Abrahams are Abrahams just according to the flesh, but according to the promise. And we are part of the promise made to Abraham. Therefore we return as well. And the wealth of the nation shall repair the city, and they will be coming there with a sincere heart. Not because it's something that they're doing out of coercion, but they now recognize the light for what it is. They recognize the truth of Christ. And they come to it to take part. Can you imagine what it must be like to live your whole life in the darkness and then come to know the light? Okay, verses... Uh, oh, yeah, we continue. That's right. Oh, yeah, this is awesome. He talks about Midian, Ephah, Sheba, Kedar, and Abayoth. This all relates to the Arabs. The end of hostilities. This is what this is talking about here. There's going to be an end of hostilities. They're going to come confessing the Lord. So this is going to end. This, what we see today, this hatred, uh, one could say began when Ishmael was born, <laughs> or when Isaac was born, <laughs> and then Ishmael got kicked out. Right? But they're, they're embracing one another in brotherhood and they are acceptable to come to God's altar. 
our brothers and sisters in Christ, right? Oh, yeah. I'm just going to take this out, but I left it in. All right, notice that gold and frankincense are mentioned here without myrrh. Gold and frankincense are very precious, okay? Uh, gold, of course, is very precious. Frankincense is a, an, a resin that comes from a certain tree, and you burn it, it smells incredible. And uh, so they're, they're bringing gifts here, right? Uh, myrrh is not mentioned. Not that myrrh needed to be mentioned, but myrrh, as far as the gift of the three wise men, you can think of it in terms of the gold and the frankincense as being uh, worldly riches, spiritual riches, and the myrrh for the sufferings of Christ. But the sufferings are over. So if you want to think of it in those terms, you can. The coastlands here, uh, I believe it's verse 9. The coastlands is always referring to pretty much all the Gentiles. Directly it's referring to the coastlands of the Mediterranean. And of course Tarshish is mentioned specifically, which uh, Tarshish is modern day Cadiz in Spain. I, I like to thank the Spanish people and the Phoenician society for opening my eyes to that fact uh, because it's always been known by them in that area. Uh, but at any rate, the point is that uh, ships of Tarshish and the, the, the ships of Tarshish were the best in the Mediterranean. They went the longest distance. If you can think of going all the way from, from Israel to Spain, it is a long journey and you need the best, most seaworthy vessel. Okay, but these are now coming from far away. The idea is it's coming from far away, bringing your sons and daughters, bringing the wealth of nations into the dwelling place of the Redeemer, the light, the dwelling place of the light. It's not for, <laughs> for a financial gain that God is having the wealth of nations coming into Jerusalem. It is for the beautification of His dwelling. And, and it represents also uh, the people saying, yes, we believe in what's going on here. This is the place. Is He robbing all the nations? That is not at all what it's saying here. And it's not, you've been defeated, and now we're going to get our booty from the battlefield. These are believers that are coming to bring the wealth from the nations. And finally, everything's going to be right. Uh, Jerusalem will be righteous and the Messiah will be the rule of the world. No more uh, worrying about Putin or Kim Jong-un, Jong -un, that Jong-un <laughs> over there. No more worrying about that kind of business. Uh, it's the reign of the Messiah. It is a new age. It is the millennial reign that is being referred to here. And then all of this, in this section, all of this is for God's glory not man's glory. We glory in God. I, I want Him to have the glory. I do not want me to have the glory. Do you want you to have the glory? I mean, maybe you, you should be lifted on high and as the ultimate example of love and perfection. Ooh. <laughs> Get that light off me. You're going you're gonna to see all the spots. Let me put that cloak on me of, of Christ. and No, rather put Christ up there. Alright, verses 10 through 14. Foreigners will build up your walls, and their kings will minister to you. For in my wrath I struck you. For in my wrath I struck you. I wonder how that pertains to striking a, a church. God struck a church, uh, if that's what it's talking about here. But God says, For in my wrath I struck you, and in my favor I have had compassion on you. <laughs> Your gates will be open continually. They will not be closed day or night, so that men may bring to you the wealth of the nations, with their kings led in procession. For the nation and the kingdom which will not serve you will perish, and the nations will be utterly ruined. The glory of Lebanon will come to you, the juniper, the box tree, and the cypress together, to beautify the place of my sanctuary, and I will make the place, my feet, uh, the place of my feet glorious. 
The sons of those who afflicted you will come bowing to you, and all those who despised you will bow themselves at the soles of your feet, and they will call you the city of the Lord, the Zion of the Holy One of Israel. I did not realize how much time we've been doing this. I've been too excited myself. But it is, it is time. <laughs> Let me get through this section. His dwelling will be in security from all nations. There's uh, no need to fear anymore in Israel. You don't even have to uh, close the gates. The gates, there'll be no fear of attack. Who's going to attack God anyway? Especially after what He had done. Uh, and His dwelling is going to be made beautiful, and all the former en enemies now come in humility, and they embrace the truth. That's the important thing. They embrace the truth. It's over. No more, yes, but what about uh, Muhammad, the prophet? Uh, that won't be there anymore. Uh, wh what about Joseph Smith? No more. What about the Pope? No more. It's Christ. Christ reigning. And Jerusalem will be the city of the I Am, the city of the Holy One of Israel. And of course now, uh, or, or at any time here recently, we've never seen where Jerusalem is called uh, the city of Yahweh, the city of I Am, or the city of the Holy One of Israel. Uh, so this is something that's definitely taking place in the future. Okay, uh, so let's look at 60, 15 through 22. It says, Whereas you have been forsaken and hated, with no one passing through, I will make you an everlasting pride, a joy from generation to generation. You will also suck the milk of nations and suck the breast of kings. Then you will know that I, the Lord, am your Savior and your Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. Instead of bronze, I will bring gold, and instead of iron, I will bring silver, and instead of wood, bronze, and instead of stones, iron. And I will make peace your administrators, and righteousness your overseers. That is, I will make, right? That's future. Uh, violence will not be heard again in your land. It says the word land there, not church, right? In your land, nor devastation or destruction within your borders. But you will call your wall salvation and your gates praise. No longer will you have the sun for light by day, nor the brightness will the moon give you light, nor for brightness will the moon give you light. But you will have the Lord for an everlasting light. The Lord is the light. You see that? And your God for your glory. God is your glory, not yourself. Uh, verse 20, your sun will no longer set, nor will your moon wane, for you will have the Lord for an everlasting light, and the days of your mourning will be over. Then, then all your people will be righteous. They will possess the land forever, the branch of my planting, the work of my hands, that I may be glorified. The smallest one will become a clan, or will become a thousand, and the least one a mighty nation. I, the Lord, will hasten it in its time. Uh, did you see that? So they were forsaken. The time of judgment on His promised land and people has passed. They, they were forsaken. They were forsaken and hated, it says there. But He says, I will make you an everlasting pride. A joy from generation to generation. So this is talking about, of course, all that we've seen here in Isaiah. All the judgment that's happened upon them in the promised land, in Zion. A Redeemer comes to Zion. Right? That is a particular geographical place. Uh, but, but now that time of judgment has passed. The time of blessing has arrived. And what's going to come to them is the wealth of nations and better building materials for the temple. You see that? Uh, there's going to be a new exchange, if you think of it that way. Bronze. Instead of bronze, they're going to get gold. So gold will be as, as common as bronze and silver as iron. 
and bronze as wood, and iron as stones. So it's better building materials for the temple, and they're going to live in safety. A peace will be their administrators and righteousness, and God will be their light. And this is totally the picture that we see in the end of Revelation. God is their light. There is no need for the light of the sun or moon, because God is their light. And that's important to see that God is the one that is shining. Arise and shine. God is the one who is the light. And this is great, because finally, this part here, finally the people of God will be without sin. All your people will be righteous, and they will possess the land forever. The time of judgment has passed. The blessedness of God multiplies the efforts of His people so that, and this is also something that you see as a blessing of the law, uh, where uh, one may make thousands flee in the, in the sense of war, but war has passed. This is now saying the smallest one will become like a thousand or like a clan, as it says here in, in the New American Standard. And the least one, a mighty nation. God will multiply the efforts of His people beyond what is the current measure. So this is... Well, well let's, let me ask this. What, what is Isaiah 60 all about? When you look at it in context, is it about a blessed church that is in the light and all the blessings that they get if they live in the light, especially speaking in terms of finances and money? Is that what chapter 60 is talking about? Or is chapter 60 talking about walking in a light kind of lifestyle? It's, it's not, yeah, it's not talking about either of those. It is very clear when you read it in context what it is talking about. It is talking about the, the fulfillment of so many promises made to Israel. Promises made to Abraham, right? Promises made to David. Promises that the prophets talked about. This is a fulfillment of that time. This is the millennial reign of Christ. Okay? Um, and th that's where you really need to work on your own hermeneutics. You need to be able to understand Scripture in its proper context, or you will fall into uh, the deceit that especially the gentleman on top has fallen into. Everything for him is, well, mainly seems to be financial blessings from God and temporal at that. Uh, th this is about Christ reigning, and Christ is the light. The church is not the light. God is the light. Here we reflect the light, but here we fall. I mean, there are several verses in here that, that speak against, or, or I, you can't apply it to the church, uh, especially like verse 15. Whereas you have been forsaken and hated, with no one passing through, I will make you an everlasting pride, a joy from generation to generation. And then verse 18, a violence will not be heard again in your land. So was violence heard in this man's church, or was no one passing through? I mean, is that really what this is talking about? Or is it talking about what everything else in Isaiah has been talking about? Judgment and the return of the righteous remnant and the fulfillment of so many promises through this messianic kingdom. And then the guy in the bottom, he just he made a mistake, I think, in, in uh, walking in a light lifestyle. This, this is not talking to you about, well, you need to start living righteously sh so that you can. This is talking about God coming to Zion and God ruling from there and really changing us and that we, we will no longer be sinners. Or we will no longer sin. We will be. Then all your, verse 21, then all your people will be righteous. They will possess the land forever. Okay, so you've got to understand these concepts, and, and you've got to understand what's been going on in Isaiah to really get it. Otherwise, you're, you're going to fall into, uh, perhaps fall into one of these camps or some other camp. So what about some applications? 
And, okay, this is an ex the first one's an external application. It's not something that I'm getting out of chapter 60. It's something I got out of seeing what others were getting out of chapter 60. You've got to be careful that you study God's Word and show yourself an approved workman that can rightly handle God's Word. Otherwise, you're going to wind up... You may give a good sermon that has nothing to do with the passage you're talking about. Or you may have these blinders on your eyes to what the truth is, or are these filters that you put on your eyes where all you ever see is uh, something like the Word of Faith people want you to see. Always financial blessings. Study God's Word. Yet yeah, you need the Holy Spirit. You also need to use the brain that God gifted you with. Your eyes to read your ears to hear what other people have said and get plugged into that. Get plugged into the proper context. Okay, but here's some applications from the chapter itself. Set your hope on your current king. The light of the world is Jesus Christ. We're not going to find our answers in Obama or Trump or Cruz or Clinton or any of these others. Jesus Christ is the light of the world, and He is our King. And also, do not get in, too entangled in the affairs of the state that rejects your King. Every nation is going to be coming to the light. You know what that means? If every nation is coming to the light in this millennial kingdom, that means that they did not have the light. So don't, don't think that because you're a great patriot and you love America and America's on God's side, don't think of it that way. America, too, will be among the nations who is going to be drawn to the light because America is not the light. Just because there's a bunch of Christians in this nation doesn't mean that we are the millennial reign of Christ. No. Uh, and of course, uh, other application, and there's, there's many applications you can get from this. But uh, what are you convicted about, right? The last one. What are you convicted about? Listen, we've got one king, and we've got... Uh, <laughs> I mean, I know your patriotism is going to conflict with this, but we have but one king. Okay? So fix your hope on him. He is the light. Why not be drawn to the light right now? Be drawn to the light now. All right, any, any questions? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word. I thank you for uh, this class. I thank you so much that you are the king and you are the light. Today, you are our light and we see it now. Help us to fix our eyes on you and help us to rightly handle your word. Guide us with the tools you've given us. Guide us with your spirit. Father, we want to honor you with our lives. And, and Lord, I want to pray for those other pastors, especially the one who's so caught up in wealth, and, and he himself is a very wealthy man, and he wants his people to be so wealthy. Lord, convict him and convict them of the emptiness of the path that they are on. Help them to see the truth. And for that other pastor, Lord, uh, help him. I, I, I get the sense that he's a good guy and probably we agree on all sorts of things, but just in this instance, he kind of, he spent too much time on one particular word and it, and it drew him off topic. He had a good sermon to preach, but it, it drew him off the topic of this particular chapter. Uh, Father, bless them and, and bless people in the class and and help us to to do what it is that you're calling us to do today with the thing that you've convicted some of these to do help them to do it we pray this in jesus name amen